Well, good morning uh, for all of us who are here in the room and not on the beach somewhere. Welcome into worship. And for those of you who are watching online, because I know you are while you're also at the beach, we're thrilled for you too. And we'll, we'll just give them a, let's give them some applause for being so faithful to God that even on vacation, they are sitting on the beach in the warm weather, enjoying and soaking up the sun and still thinking about Jesus. So we're, we're thrilled for those people who are joining us online. Uh, today, I want to show you a few pictures as we get started. Uh, we are in the middle of a sanctuary renovation, and I show you in part today so you can see what that's going to look like. And uh, some of you uh, maybe uh, worship in, in the sanctuary at 815 or 11 and are here at 930. So um, you, can, you can see there. Uh, some of what's coming, and um, the, the main purpose behind this renovation is really out of our vision to be as welcoming of, of a place as possible, to invite people to come fully alive in a relationship with Christ. And so uh, bottom line, sound, seeing and, and hearing in that room be were becoming a problem. Our technology was outdated. So uh, you'll see that there's actually more technology in the room, but it's less visible. So that's really important for a sacred space in the sanctuary. You also see that the carpet and um, uh, the, the, you can't really see the pews have been updated just a little, little bit, the upholstery of the pews. But you'll see also several elements that are important to our understanding of what it means to uh, worship in a sacred way. Uh, so, so the... The banners that are in addition and some uh, new updated um, uh, cross and, and candles and pyramids on the altar there, as well as a little bit better accessibility onto the chancel area there in the sanctuary. So um, I show it partly so you can see what it's going to look like and continue to pray for uh, that, that process just as we're just uprooted a little bit, but mostly so you can pray for the people who will be uprooted. And so we will have an 11 o'clock service in here this Sunday and next Sunday because we don't have access to the sanctuary. So um, just love on those people who are coming in as you're going out. You don't always get to see them. So that maybe is a, a chance for some interaction. And you might say, oh, I didn't know you go to church here. Or I haven't seen you in five years. And they say, well, I, I come every Sunday. So this is, this is how that works out. So it's a chance just uh, out of the flow to do something different and to, uh, to be the church because we are, are all um, part of this church and part of the same mission. We are, uh, one of the things that joins us is our, our shared uh, conversation and, and wrestling around God's word. And uh, so the sermon, uh, I think you know this, at each of our places, each of our worship venues, each of our campuses is the same. And we've been doing this series uh, through Lent that is helping us gain perspective on the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, helping us see from different perspectives what was going on in the story. So today we come to the perspective of two people who share a common experience. They are both highly respected leaders of the Hebrew faith. They are both part of the Jewish ruling council, the Supreme Court, or the Sanhedrin uh, of uh, ancient Israel. They are both in a position of power and prestige and, uh, and have great possessions. And both men enter the story through the, sh the, the shared experience, the common experience of taking Jesus' body down from the cross. So uh, this, is, it's, 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 this is a really intimate, very deep dive sort of experience. These men literally touched the body of our Lord and prepared him for burial, provided the place for him to be buried. It's an up-close and personal, intimate kind of thing. But what's interesting about both of these men is that is not where they started. And their journey, their progression is really, I think, the thing that we want to look at today that we can gain perspective on for our own journey. Because where both of these men, be, be, men began was actually in the opposite way. They were both hiding in the shadows because of their position, because of who they were and what it re would represent to follow Jesus. They're people who held back. And then for some reason have this experience where they no longer hold back, no longer stay in the shadows, but come, come out and take action. Both men first engaged Jesus in secret. And so while Jesus had a very public ministry, these men, men remain hidden in the shadows. And it's not until Jesus dies that they step out. What can we learn from that? Well, let's look at their perspective. The first man that we read about in the scripture today is Joseph of Arimathea. And we uh, find that in John 19, 38. As with many of these characters that we've been looking at in this series, he gets one verse here. 
Uh, it says, afterwards, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked for permission to take Jesus' body down. All four Gospels mention Joseph of Arimathea, but he's not a well-known uh, character. Some of us maybe don't recognize his name. He's not mentioned before this event. And we honestly don't even know for sure where Arimathea is. There are some different theories about that. And it says a town in Judah, so it was a, a town nearby. But we don't really know for positive where he was even from. We do learn some important things about him from this verse. The first thing it says is that he was a secret disciple for fear of the Jewish leaders, of which he was a part. So he's an insider, and he is part of the discussions, part of the trial, part of the interactions with Jesus that lead to his death. And in that way, he's, he is culpable in a, in a way. He's part of what leads Jesus to the cross. But he's also holding back. It says in one of the verses that we read this morning that he did not consent to that uh, verdict of Jesus. And we sort of wonder why he's kind of caught in this tension. Who is this person that's kind of living on both sides of the, of the fence or straddling the fence and maybe pulled in one direction and pulled in another? And why didn't he do this or why didn't he do that might be something that would come to mind as we read his story. Why didn't he step up? Why did he wait till after Jesus died to, to, to step up? And yet many of us can relate to his experience, can't we? This tension that we all experience in some way or another between the way things are and the way we hope they would be. We can imagine that Joseph held back for some very practical reasons. That Jesus represented a threat to all he had accomplished and accumulated in his life. That if he um, had stepped out and acknowledged or stood up for Jesus, that much was at stake. That his career, his livelihood, the things that he had accumulated would have been called into question. Matthew tells us he's a rich man. Matthew and Mark tell us that he was a ruler, one of the Sanhedrin. Luke calls him a good and upright or righteous man. And Mark describes Joseph as one waiting on the kingdom of God to come. So there's that tension. A tension that maybe we can relate to. It's a tension between fear and faith. A tension between caution and courage. The tension between this, this hope that we might have for a different reality and the reality that we find ourselves living in. We all know what it's like to not know exactly what the right thing is to do or how to do it. That's Joseph. While Joseph's first mention in the Gospels comes from, from this uh, passage near the end of Jesus' life, Nicodemus, Nicodemus comes earlier on. Nicodemus actually comes 16 verses earlier in, in John's Gospel, not in, in John 19, but in John, John 3. So John 19, 39 says, Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, which is a reference to an experience earlier on, also came and bringing about 75 pounds of embalming ointment made from myrrhs and aloes. So Nicodemus, we do know a little bit more about. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a strict person. He was a, a teacher and a leader. And he had come to Jesus at night, and that goes back to John chapter 3. And the real question for, Jesus, for Nicodemus coming to, to Jesus was a question of who the Messiah was and whether Jesus was it. Nicodemus comes under the cloak of darkness, so he and Joseph both have that secretive thing going on. He comes under the cloak of darkness, yet with enough curiosity, enough questioning, that he's going to go to Jesus and hear straight from him what he has to say. And Nicodemus is surprised. He's, um, he's caught off guard. He's, he's supposed to be the religious leader, and Jesus takes him to school and Jesus says some things in John 3 that we might recognize. One of the things that Jesus says to Nicodemus is in John 3, 3. Unless a person is born from above or born again, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. So the idea of an internal birth or rebirth or change from the inside out was something that Jesus needed to explain to Nicodemus. It was something maybe of a struggle for him and for many of us who are concerned about what's going on from the outside. What, what ends up happening with a lot of people who are religious, that it can easily uh, become about external things and how things look from the outside and what we do on the outside and the change that we try to bring 
comes maybe from the outside in. But Jesus describes just the opposite. He describes a change from the inside out. He, he describes a focus on what's going on on the inside of a person and a rebirth, a change that happens, a transformation that happens that leads from change that goes from inside out to all of life, a change of the heart. And that's how we are part of God's kingdom. This conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus is where we find one of, if not the most recognized scripture, at least in the New Testament, what many would call the core of the gospel message for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's Jesus speaking to Nicodemus in the middle of the night, trying to help him understand what he doesn't understand on this side of the, of the story. Before Nicodemus steps forward, before he comes out of the shadows, in the shadows, Jesus is telling this man this is what it is all about. It is about God's love that is so powerful that he has come to save whosoever would believe in it. Whosoever would simply trust and from that internal trust let everything else flow. To be part of a worldwide cosmic movement of grace that is going out of the shadows and into the light. A life of service, a life of love, a life of sacrifice that Jesus himself would exhibit on the cross. Both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea have to undergo some sort of transformation that leads them from hiding in the shadows to coming out and stepping forward. Their strategy was a little bit of wait and see. They are certainly motivated by fear and self-protection. They are rightly concerned that they could risk it all by saying yes to Jesus. They were at the top of the cultural achievement ladder. Their lives were good. They had everything to lose. And they had to determine if they had anything to gain. Joseph and Nicodemus began in one place, and their attitudes and, their, and the trappings that kept them there were things that they had to overcome. But they, they didn't end there. Their story doesn't end there. Their story ends... Uh, after the death of Jesus, when they do something that we might consider unexpected if we know the first part of the story. They, they step out of the shadows. They ask for Jesus' body. Joseph likely signed for it. Uh, there, there, were, there were procedures somewhat like what we would have today. Joseph went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. He, he would have had to sign his name on the, on, on the line for that. Very likely he would have had to give Pilate some money for that. That's probably how the system worked. So there was some sacrifice there, but also some, some ties, some financial connections to who Jesus was. But it's very much Joseph stepping out of the shadows and taking action. And that action was to take Jesus' body and give it a proper burial. To give Jesus dignity and honor in death that he didn't have in his life. Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of embalming uh, ointments, it says, which some scholars have said would be the amount that you would reserve for a king. It's a lot. So Nicodemus also steps forward out of the shadows in a big way. They had been engaging Jesus from a great distance, but now they are up close and personal, about as up close and personal as it gets. They engage, engage Jesus in one of the most humbling ways possible. We imagine them taking the little body of our Lord from the cross and preparing it for burial. Their hands that had been pure and clean are now dirty. So what leads someone from one extreme to the other? What is their perspective that we need to sort of be able to see? What, what leads us in a process from sort of holding back to stepping forward? Well, thanks for asking because I have some thoughts on that. We're going to call this the Excellent Adventures of Nick and Joe, because Nicodemus and Joseph are getting too hard for me to say. But there's a combination of things that tend to come with their perspective, with wealth and status and leadership, that let's just be frank, some of us can relate to. For whatever level of leadership or position or prestige or status that some of us have in the community or in, in, our, in our work, uh, we can relate to some of their experience. We are a little bit more on the, 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 the higher end of things. The, the upper middle class perspective is our perspective. So we can relate to some of this. For those of us who have uh, positions of leadership in the church, 
and the idea that we sort of have this standard to hold and we've got to hold back and make, make decisions that are wise and uh, about discernment, sometimes those get caught up in some very human things in the church. So those of us who lead the church need to pay attention. Nick and Joe had a special combination of things that tend to come with their perspective. And I want to put these four things on the screen and see where we might relate to their perspective. Four words, power, prestige, preferences, and possessions. This list of things represents a lot of things that we don't usually give up very easily. Things that we tend to hold on to. Tends that, tend, the things that we tend to want to grab hold of and accumulate rather than turn loose of and, gi- and give away. Power, which really is about a sense of control. None of us like to feel out of control. And so power is usually, I think, about control. Power so often is about controlling the world around us so that we can feel safe. So that we can exert some sort of control so things don't seem out of kilter. Power is often about security and safety. Prestige, which represents the approval of others and the need to be seen from the outside in a certain way. Our need for acceptance and affirmation for other pe- from other people. Prestige or popularity is about how we are viewed from the outside and it cares mostly about status and image. Rather than living from the inside out as Jesus described, prestige is primarily about living from the outside in. Not, motiv- by, by, not motivated by character or integrity, but, but by people pleasing, by external motivations, people's opinions or approval. Preference is pretty simple. It places my wants and my needs above everything else. It is the opposite of what Jesus described and he taught us to pray to to God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. Preferences tend to be about what I want and ultimately the prayer is my will be done. And then possessions which may be the easiest part of this to understand and may be the hardest thing for us to give up or to put at risk. Possessions represent security and safety. Stuff represents stability. Today, as much as ever, our identity gets caught up with our stuff. The motto of contemporary life could easily be, you are what you own. These are not things that we like to give up. And they they have to do with a sense of our place in the world and what we might lose if we would give them up. And again, the most important thing to notice is that people don't give these things up easily. People's lives are are built on preserving these things, not risking them. People spend their energy accumulating these things, not giving them up. We don't give these things away easily. We want safety and security above all else, and these things represent that. It makes me think of a story Erwin McManus uh, tells. It sort of gets to the heart of how complicated this feels for us. Uh, This is a pastor in California who was putting one of his kids to bed at night, and the little little girl was scared. And so she asked, uh, I think scared of the dark or monsters or something like that. She asked dad, this pastor, uh, who's written several books on uh, leadership in the church, to pray for her to be safe which is a thing we want for all of our children. But as he describes that, he, he, he realized it was something that he couldn't ultimately promise. One of the things we struggle with the most as parents is that we just don't know. And so he, he decided that night, and maybe other nights he might have said, you know, just a, a prayer that God would watch over her, and we, we've maybe of all as parents prayed that prayer. That night he decided to teach his daughter something. He said, honey, I'm not sure I can promise that you will be safe. But here's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray to God that you'll be dangerous. And that gets at this switch that we see that happens with Nick and Joe in their process of coming to Jesus. In following Jesus and seeing in him something different, they come face to face with what has been called the downward mobility of Jesus, of someone who gave up everything for the sake of love. If we look at that list of of things uh, on, on the screen, these are things that Jesus gladly and willingly relinquished in order to love us. In Jesus, they found someone who would give up power and control and place his life in God's hands, ultimately to the point of death itself. Jesus trusted Jesus. And yet, above anybody else who had hoarder, hoarded power and control, Jesus had more influence than anyone they had encountered. In Jesus, they found someone who was willing to give up the prestige of heaven for the stable 
nursery and a criminal's cross. In Jesus, they encountered someone who had given up his preferences to live his life for others and for God. In Jesus, they had met someone who had given up possessions to live an itinerant life in order to be free to offer his life as a sacrifice to God. Philippians 2 captures this switch, and it gives it to us as advice on how to live. Jenny read to us this uh, earlier in worship from the New International Version. I want to read this from the Message Version of Scripture. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, which is an important word, isn't it? He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what. Not at all. In fact, when the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Indeed, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Engaging Jesus means that we risk what we would rather keep safe and give up in order to gain. What leads someone from one extreme to the other, from what Nick and Joe began uh, with and where they ended up, from hiding in the shadows to stepping forward, from holding back to, to, to leaping and leaning in, Well, it's what we see in Jesus himself. The answer is simply what happens when we engage Jesus, when we follow Jesus. Following Jesus is a process of trusting God on the path of downward mobility, of giving up and risking things that we would usually grab hold of, accumulate, and hoard. Taking up a service orientation toward those around us and to God. It's impossible to follow Jesus and hoard power and prestige and preference and possession. It's impossible to follow Jesus and not give up these things in some way or another or risk them for the sake of following. When we engage Jesus, there will be a point when we have a decision to make. And for many of us, when we follow Jesus, there will be a point when we gladly give up these things because we know there's so much more to gain. But that's the switch, I think. And it's what we see in people who are following Jesus around us, the people who give up time to mentor a child. I have this guy that I see at the gym every once in a while, and he always wants to talk about, like, this is the highlight of his week, that he gets to go and mentor a kid at one of our elementary schools for for 30 minutes or so. It's people who give up a comfortable bed so that they can come into the church and sleep on a cot with their homeless friends. It's our staff here at Broadway who sacrifice in order to serve. It's Ashley and Justin Guest, Ashley who grew up in this church and then went to serve in Honduras and lived there to serve children. It's people in our congregation who give generously and serve selflessly. selflessly. It's many who find their purpose not in what they gain but what they give. And um, there are examples of that all around us. One of those is in the, just the, the way we come into worship. When we offer ourselves week in and week out to this process, what we realize is that we're coming not just to find security and not just to find comfort. Those, those things are there. But it's more than that. It's what, it's what Nick and Joe discovered, that it's not just about security, but it's also about being dangerous. It's not coming just to, for Jesus to make us feel better about ourselves, but for Jesus to challenge us and give us purpose that's beyond ourselves. And when we, when we treat worship that way, when we treat our small groups that way, when we come into Bible studies so that we can be challenged with the possibility of the kingdom of God, we become like Nicodemus and Joseph as people who are waiting on the kingdom of God, who are looking and watching and hoping that God will act and then we'll have the courage that we'll be ready and prepped to, to step out of the shadows when the time comes and step forward. So that's a way for us to think about all that we do, actually, in the church. A vision of a church that's preparing, molding, and shaping, and forming individuals and as a whole so that we'll be ready to act when the time, when the time comes. Our sanctuary renovation that I mentioned earlier might be an example of that. Some of our folks, uh, our choir and our staff and some other of our leaders went into the sanctuary, which is something we've done in every one of our other worship venues. But the sanctuary, uh, we, we uh, had the carpet down before we learned that we could do this. We, uh, we went in and wrote scriptures and prayers on the floor. 
So I want to show you a, a few of those that get at what we're doing when we come into worship. It's not just so that we can be comfor comforted, but also that we can be challenged. I love Kentucky. <laughs> so that we can be ready so, and prayed up so that when Jesus speaks, we're ready to go. Today, we have an exciting adventure that's beginning with a Burmese congregation that came to us several months ago and has worshipped here a few times, sort of, uh, tr we're trying things out. But uh, we begin today, uh, this afternoon, uh, that the, this, uh, the, these, our Burmese friends will begin worshipping weekly uh, on Sunday afternoons at our Greenwood campus. And that's some of, our, some of those guys there, and so uh, that represents... Uh, a real answer to prayer as we've been praying together as a church that we would have a vision for reaching beyond the, the sort of constraints that we currently have that have to do with people like to be with people who are like them. And so it's, it's, it's a challenging thing to open up new opportunities and, and to see where God is at work and then join him in that work with other people groups. And then this group of people came to us. And they even helped us out because the pastor and the lay leader have the same name. Their, their name is Tang, T-A-N-G, which is like the coolest name ever. Like we don't even have to remember like complicated names. It's like just call up Tang and we'll work out the details. And um, so they, they uh, are beginning a, a trial with us for three months to see if it works for them to worship at our Greenwood campus. And that represents, I think, something that we also want to be ready for, that there are other groups of people throughout our uh, city for sure and throughout Kentucky and throughout our world that, that Christ has called us to en engage and, and to be ready for. Th those are just some of the examples of the many ways that we are called to be ready in a process that transforms us to serve like Jesus did. And ultimately, we come to that in communion. Um, we do this at our 815 service every week. Uh, we do this in this uh, service every month. And a, a large part of, of what we do in communion is just grounding ourselves in the story of the one who willingly gave up so much so that he could gain. The one who risked so much so that rather than accumulating things of the world, might store up things of heaven. And we want to bring ourselves to that story today and ground ourselves in it. And so as we prepare for communion and as those who are coming to serve come forward, uh, let's pray together. God, we confess that from a human perspective, our goal in life is to accumulate power and prestige and preference and possession. But today we willingly submit ourselves to the way of Jesus the way that is the opposite of the way of the, of the world around us. We bring our lives before the one who died on the cross. We bring our hearts and our minds, our wills, our attitudes before the one who willingly sacrificed, who gave up so much that we might gain. We confess that we don't always live the way of Jesus, but in hope and in joy, we come before the forgiveness he offers and the possibility that we might, that we might see more clearly what it means to follow, that we might be the ones that would willingly give up so that the world could gain so that we might lay down our lives so that you might take them up and use them for your kingdom. Would you bring us to this story as we come to the bread and to the cup this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he said, take, drink, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins sealed in my blood. Every time you drink this, remember me. These are symbols of sacrifice. And so we invite you uh, to be a church that comes willingly to the sacrifice that you receive from Jesus as a way of taking into your own body and into your life, a way of life that you leave from this place to carry forth. 
Uh, we invite you, if you are a member of this church or a, a guest of this church or if you've never been to this church before and just happened to um, come by this morning and follow the little green signs in, you're welcome to come to communion. Everyone is welcome. People of all races, people of all status, all of that finds level ground at the cross and before the bread and the cup. I invite you to take a piece of the bread and break it off and then dip it into the cup and then take it that way. And then you'll be free uh, if you want to go back to your seat and pray or stay here at the front and uh, come up to the front and, and pray. I would encourage you just to wrestle through the things that we talked about today, where power and prestige and preference and possession might be an obstacle for you and let the mercy of God gently speak to you that you would have the courage just to offer yourself as much as you can to as much of God as you know how. We'll have three stations here in the front and two in the back where you can come. And we also have gluten-free elements here uh, at the front if you, if you need those. Would you come and receive the sacrifice of love from Jesus himself as you come?